हरे कृष्ण महाराज हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण महाराज हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण महाराज ओके सो आई वॉन्ट टू गो ओवर द चैप्टर इलेवन विद यू वी वेंट थ्रू इट इन वन वन नाइट लास्ट नाइट लास्ट वीक आई I thought we'll review the eleventh chapter first of all tonight. So, let me. Uh, who's the host? Who's the host here? <clears throat> Oh, okay, okay, now I can do it, all right. All right. <clears throat> okay, 11th chapter. We get the link here. What's the connection with the 10th chapter? At the end of the 10th chapter, Lord Krishna was, ex after explaining all the vibhutis, then Lord Krishna says, What need is there for all this detailed knowledge, O Arjuna? With a single fragment of myself, I pervade and support the entire universe. So Arjuna, he wants to see that all-pervading form of the Lord. Because Krishna was speaking about it in the 10th chapter, he said, I pervade and support the entire universe. He was speaking about it, talking about it. So in the 11th chapter, Arjuna wants to see it, not just hear about it, he wants to see it. So this is the connection between the 10th and the 11th chapter, right? Although Krishna is driving Arjuna's chariot, he pervades and supports the entire universe. Arjuna therefore wishes to see Krishna's all-pervading form. Arjuna requests Krishna to reveal his universal form. Arjuna seeing Krishna drive his chariot, it's hard to understand that he's pervading and supporting the entire universe. So he wants to see how, is, how do you do it? So up here, Krishna describes his universal form and provides vision to Arjuna. Arjuna beholds, Arjuna, Arjuna beholds Krishna's universal form with astonishment. Hesitatingly, he begins to describe what he sees. Arjuna, trembling, prays to Krishna, universal form. He begs his forgiveness for having previously acted in ignorance, and he requests to withdraw his universal form and show the two-armed form. So that's the synopsis of the chapter 11. Here you can see the breakdown. First we get Arjuna's request to Krishna to show the universal form, and then Arjuna and Sanjaya are describing the universal form. And then after that we hear about the form of time, the, the, this Kala Roop, and Krishna will describe who he is, and, because Arjuna had asked. Arjuna wants to know, who are you? What is your mission? And like that. So Krishna replies, and then Arjuna offers prayers. And then, and then the final part, we can see, pure devotees can see Krishna's two-armed form. All right, so here's the first part, Arjuna's request, Krishna's description of his universal form. Arjuna, although acknowledging that the two-armed form of Krishna is supreme, he requests Krishna to show him that all-pervading form which he spoke of in chapter 10.
So the chapter begins like this, by hearing everything Krishna has said, Arjuna's illusion is removed and Arjuna expresses his understanding that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Kamala Patraksha, O Lotus-Eyed One, Arjuna addresses Krishna as Lotus-Eyed, out of joy, after knowing the facts. What does he know? What does he know? That's described in chapter 7. Krishna was described as the source of all creation, maintenance and destruction, right? Krishna says in 7.7, there's no truth superior to me, everything rests on me. And then in the ninth chapter, Lord Krishna was described there, that he's also, uh, 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 that, that he's aloof from everything. Mayatatam idam sarvam jagad avyaktamartina. His opulence was explained. He's still aloof, but he has that, he has that, at, that inconceivable opulence, that achincha shakti. And then Arjuna expresses his desire to see the form pervading and supporting the universe. And Arjuna pleads. It's important to note that Arjuna pleads. He does not order Krishna to show his form. Arjuna is, you can see Arjuna kneeling at the feet of Krishna, begging. He's not ordering, he's not equal to Krishna, and he's not going to tell Krishna what to do. So we want to understand the qualifications necessary to see Krishna's form, right? What, what's the qualification? Only possible by the mercy of Krishna. Therefore, Krishna requests, Arjuna requests rather. We can't see the form by mental speculation or by our material senses. Krishna is beyond the senses. Then Krishna's description of his own universal form. What Arjuna is going to see? Krishna describes it to Arjuna. What's he going to see? And here you see Krishna responds, offering to show Arjuna his opulences. Here's Krishna's own description of his universal form. Verse 5, Krishna shows variegated forms. Verse 6, vision of wonderful forms. Verse 6 also, no one has ever seen or heard of them before. Verse 7, vision of the entire universe. And 7 again, vision of past, present and future. And verse 8, we need divine vision. We cannot see without the grace of the Lord. So that was Krishna's description. Now, text 9 to 31, go on to describe Sanjay's description of the universal form. Sanjay's description of what was shown to Arjuna. What did Arjuna actually see? Here's Sanjay speaking to Dhritarashtra and he's describing. Sanjay describes what was shown to Arjuna by the Lord. Sanjay was provided with divine vision, with the blessings of Vyasadevs, so that he could see the happenings on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. So in subsequent verses, Sanjay describes a universal form of the Lord, which was displayed to Arjuna upon his request. Yeah, Arjuna was requesting, I want to see it. So. Sanjay is describing it. Here are some descriptions. Unlimited divine, wondrous and brilliant forms. Unlimited mouths. You can see in the picture in the illustration, so many mouths, so many eyes, ornaments, weapons, garlands. 
manifestations were distributed throughout the universe. Arjuna is seeing everything at one place, all unlimited expansions of the universe, including planets of gold, jewels, and all other kinds. Arjuna is bewildered and astonished. Hair standing on end, Arjuna bows down, begins to pray with folded hands. Arjuna speaks his realizations of the universal form. So here's the beginning of Arjuna's realization of the universal form. He sees all demigods and living entities assembled in that form. Lord Brahma is sitting on a lotus flower. Also Lord Shiva is there, all the sages, serpents. To see all at one place is possible only by Lord Krishna's grace. Krishna is unlimited. So many, many arms, bellies, mouths, eyes, without any limit, with no end, middle and beginning. Through Krishna, everything could be seen. And now, 19 to 22, we have the vision of the Kala Rup, Arjuna's vision of the Kala Rup, the form of time. First in text 19, it's described blazing fire coming from your mouth. Then text 20 describes spread throughout. Text 21 and 22, petitioned by demigods. So this is all included here within the Kala Rup. Just to describe this petitioning by the demigods, Kala Rup is petitioned by demigods and sages. All are fearful. Demigods are surrendering and praying with folded hands. Great sages are praying with Vedic hymns. Lord Shiva, Aditya, Vasus, etc. Beholding you in wonder. Then Arjuna describes more. Arjuna experienced a terrible, fearsome sight. And that's the point where the rasa changes. That before Krishna and Arjuna were friends, but now Arjuna becomes fearful because he sees this fear, this frightening vision. Demigods are disturbed. Even the demigods are disturbed at seeing great forms with so many faces, eyes, arms, everything. And Arjuna could see many radiant colors touching the sky, gaping mouths, great glowing eyes. His mind is perturbed by fear. Arjuna can no longer maintain steadiness or equilibrium of mind. Text 25, Arjuna sees blazing death-like faces, awful teeth. Arjuna is bewildered and could not keep his balance. And so this is all in relation to Kala Rup. Continuing more in relation to Kala Rup. Uh, text 28, we have a nice analogy. The analogy is about many waves of the river flow into the ocean. Just like many waves of the river flow into the ocean. Text 29, a different analogy. It's about moths, little moths, that they dash to destruction in the blazing fire. So these analogies are given to describe the universal form because so many different people were all entering into that form and they were being devoured. That's described in the next verse, text 30, that you are devouring all people from all sides. 
Your effulgence is covering all the universe with terrible, scorching rays. So, very frightening to see all of those things. You could imagine because Arjuna would recognize everything, who's, what's happening. So, text 31, Arjuna, in great fear, he asked two questions. Who are you? What is your mission? Why does Arjuna ask these questions? One, well, Arjuna knew Krishna as his friend, but he also knows him as God. So he's puzzled by the various forms shown by Krishna. So who are you and what is your mission? Krishna answers, takes 32 to 34. Time, I am destroyer of the world. Right? So this is a famous verse, text 32. I have come here to destroy all people, with the exception of you, the Pandavas. All the soldiers here on both sides will be slain. Lord Krishna's prediction. Text 32, Krishna answers Arjuna's questions. Who am I? Time I am. What's your mission? To destroy everything, all the people except Pandavas. Indicates even if Arjuna did not want to fight, they were all going to die anyway. It doesn't just depend on Arjuna fighting. Text 33, Lord Krishna says, I have already destroyed all your enemies. Become my instrument and fight and win glory. So this is the, the famous verse, right? Well, Lord Krishna is encouraging Arjuna. He's telling him, just become an instrument in my service. So Nimitta Matra, become an instrument. Nimitta Madra Bhava Savyasachi. Because Savyasachi, Arjuna, has the ability that he can fight, he can use both hands. He's a very expert archer. And what's Arjuna's motivation? He wants to please Krishna, to satisfy the desire of the Lord. And what is the Lord's desire? very specific in the material world. Why does he come? Well, he wants to establish the Pandavas on the throne. He wants to uh, he, he wants to see his devotees rule doesn't want the planet ruled by the demons. Text 34, Krishna tells Arjuna, fight and be victorious, enjoy the kingdom. So earlier we know in the very beginning in Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna didn't want to fight. But Krishna was encouraging him. Here again in the 11th chapter, Krishna is really encouraging Arjuna. He really wants him to fight. He wants Arjuna to understand his desire. And he wants Arjuna to have the right motivation why he's fighting. Ultimately, why should Arjuna fight? Simply because Krishna wants him to do it. So this points are brought out here. You can see, know my plan. Arjuna should understand the plan of Krishna and he should cooperate with it. How to know the Lord's plan? Only possible by the Lord's mercy. By the mercy of Krishna only we can know his plan. The plea of his devotees, the plan of his devotees are as good as his plans. So act in Krishna consciousness to know his plans through 
the medium of the spiritual master. So like that, follow the orders of the spiritual master. He's a representative of Krishna and he will guide us to become victorious. Okay, so Krishna spoke into Arjuna and he's, Arjuna has seen the Kala Rup. Now Arjuna is going to offer prayers. This, you have five verses, he's offering prayers. And then, 40 to 44, he wants forgiveness for his offences. And then, 45 to 46, he wants Krishna to show his two-arm form. So here we can see Arjuna's prayers, the beginning of Arjuna's prayers here, after seeing the Kala Rup. Arjuna, oh, Sanjay is narrating Arjuna's prayers, and Arjuna prays in a faltering voice, as a devotee, in the mood of wonder. So that's a different rasa. There was fear. First of all, there's friendship, then there was fear, now it's wonder. Arjuna recognizes Krishna's actions as all good for everyone. The world becomes joyful on hearing your name and everyone becomes attached to you. You are worshipped by great souls and demons, the demons are afraid of you and flee away. Krishna is worshipped by everyone, invincible source of all and cause of all causes. You are the God of all gods, the original creator, especially even greater than Brahma, the secondary creator. So like this, Lord Brahma, uh, Arjuna is offering these prayers, glorifying Lord Krishna. More about Arjuna's prayers. You are the ultimate rest of everything and all knowledge. You are the essence of everything. I offer you obeisances from front, behind and from all sides. Arjuna's prayers, begging forgiveness. Right? We spoke about this uh, offering, you know, when we, we, easy to offend someone. So here we see Arjuna and how he was getting forgiven for his offences. Uh, he begs Krishna, O infallible one, as an ordinary friend. He didn't know Krishna's glories. Arjuna felt he had offended Krishna in madness or in love. He didn't know Krishna could accept such a universal form. And he cannot forget the relationship of a friend the relationship between a living entity and Krishna is fixed eternally. It cannot be forgotten as evident from Arjuna's behavior. So Arjuna describes different ways in which he committed offenses. He called Krishna as Yadava, as Krishna and He Saketi described him as being his friend. He jested as they relaxed. They lay on the same bed. They sat together, ate together. Arjuna is begging forgiveness. Text 43. You gave this knowledge to Brahma, to Arjun. You are the Supreme Father, you are the greatest, no one is greater than or equal to you, and nor can anyone be one with you. So Arjuna falls on the ground, he begs for mercy, he requests Krishna to tolerate all wrong. Just forgive him for his being over familiar and his impudence. He was impudent, he addressed, hey Krishna, hey Yadava, again, hey Saketi, this, and he, he, Arjuna talks about just like a, a wife forgives the familiarity of her partner, or a friend 
will also tolerate the importance of a friend, Krishna, Arjuna, relationship is that of friendship. Arjuna requests to withdraw the fearsome form and reveal the form as personality of Godhead. So he wants to see not the universal form, he wants to see the four-handed form. First he wants to see the four-handed form. Described in 45 and 46, Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He's the source of all forms and incarnations and he's the constant feature in these forms. He is God in any of his innumerable forms. He is non-different from his expansions. He's always fresh like a young man. Okay, coming on to the final section. Only pure devotees can see Krishna's two-armed supreme form. First of all, we'll see text 47, 48. Krishna glorifies bhakti by negation of the other processes. Krishna says, who can have this divine vision? Only godly souls, only devotees. Devotees, but devotees do not want to see this universal form. They're qualified to see it, but they don't want to see it. They follow, follow other, even if you have other qualifications, it's insignificant, not enough. You may do sacrifices, you study the Vedas, you give charity, did a lot of pious activities, you may be a big impersonalist, but it's not going to get you in to see the universal form or to see the Lord's transcendental form. Devotees do not want to see the universal form, although they are qualified to see. Hmm. We're happy to see Krishna in his original form. Krishna shows his forearm form, then the two-arm form. The two-arm form is described as somyavapu, the beautiful form. So that indicates a very beautiful form. Krishna's form is the most beautiful. Who can see this form? devotees. Krishna shows this form because he knows Arjuna's ultimate interest is not in the, not in the four-handed form. The four-handed form is contained within the two-handed form. All of the forms are within the original form and the original form is there in the two-handed form. Just like at the birth of Lord Krishna, Krishna appeared to Vasudeva and Devaki as four-handed in the Narayan form, but then he transformed himself to an ordinary child at the request of Devaki for protection. Going ahead, 51 and 52, Arjuna's mind is pacified and restored on seeing Krishna's two-handed form. We can see the universal form. If you just even have a tinge of bhakti, it's enough to see the universal form. Two-handed form is more difficult to see than the universal form. Krishna's two-handed form is more difficult. Even for the demigods like Lord Shiva, Lord Brahma, difficult for them to see. How fools deride Krishna. That's also mentioned. They deride, they think Krishna is an ordinary person. Krishna's bodies, they don't understand his transcendental nature. Then 53, 54, 
there's a direct glorification of bhakti and the importance of understanding Krishna. The two-handed form cannot be seen by any endeavor, not by studying the Vedas or charity or worship, only by undivided devotional service, Krishna says, can I be understood as I am, standing before you and can thus be seen directly. Only in this way can, can you enter into the mysteries of my understanding. Right? What, what is difficult to understand? Which methods make it difficult? And what can you learn about him? So this is all important here. What is difficult to understand? Well, it's difficult to understand that he came from parents in a four-handed form and at once changed to a two-handed form. Not easy for people to understand these things. What makes it difficult? Which methods make it difficult? Difficult to understand by all these other things like studying the Vedas and so on. Unless you go through devotional service, it's very difficult. And then the final verse of the 11th chapter, shown here. Only the most purified devotional service, free from jnana and karma, executed without envy, can bring one to understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So, this, uh, you can see in the diagram that five different characteristics of Ananya Bhakti, which are highlighted in the purport there by Srila Prabhupada. First of all, Mat Parama, make me the supreme goal. And then Mat Bhakta, engaged in my devotional service. Then Sangavarjita, free from contamination of fruitive acts and mental speculation. Then Nirvaya Sarva Bhuteshu, friendly to all living beings. And the first one should have been Mat Karmakrit, engaged in doing my work. So these are the five characteristics of Ananya Bhakti. Right? Work, we have to work, can't do it. We, the devotional service is activity. When you study nectar of devotion, it's described the importance of activity. We have to work for Krishna. And so that's brought out here, Mat Karma Krit, Master Krishna Karma, work for Krishna, engaged in doing work for Krishna, not just for our own self, but working for Krishna. Then Mat Parama, make Krishna the supreme goal. Yeah, the goal of life is not material profit or progress in any kind of material realm, but the, pro the goal of life is to please Krishna. Krishna is the goal, nothing else. Mad Bhakta, engaged in my devotional service. Devotional service means nine angas, hearing, chanting, remembering, worshipping, offering prayers, serving the lotus feet, befriending, uh, surrendering everything, like that, becoming the serv uh, nine different processes. So engage in Krishna's one of, at least one of these processes. Free from the contamination of fruit of acts and mental speculation. That's often brought out in, by Rupa Goswami in his definition of Bhakti Yoga. The pure devotional service means without desire for karma or jnana. Karma means we want to enjoy the material world. And jnana is the desire for liberation. So this is a contamination, fruit of activities, mental speculation. 
mental speculation, they're the jnanis who want liberation, and the fruit of acts, that's the karmis. Nirvayar sarva bhuteshu, friendly to all living beings. We see all living entities equally. Everyone is part and parcel of Lord Krishna. So we're equal to everyone, merciful to everyone. And then the final text. One who engages in my pure devotional service, free from the contamination of fruit of activities and mental speculation, who works for me, who makes me the goal of life, and who is friendly to every living being, he certainly comes to me. So, some lessons to be learned. Text 33. Stay motivated. Act in Krishna Consciousness and the Lord will take care of the rest, right? That's a Nimitta Matra Bhava Sabya Satchin. So be an instrument in the service of Lord Krishna. Act in Krishna Consciousness. And Krishna will take care of the results, the rest. That's up to Krishna. Our duty is to give service. So it's an important point. And then verse 44, practicing tolerance, right? Very important for us sometimes devotees, oh, I can't tolerate this, oh, no. We have to tolerate. We, these are tests. Krishna tests the devotees. We get tested. We have to be willing to be tested. So text 44, we have various relationships and the key ingredient is to have a long-lasting relationship. It's the ability to tolerate. And one can do that with their heart only if we practice forgiveness. When Krishna can tolerate and forgive us, why can't we do the same to others? And so it's very important, you know, we get these problems so many times people say, Oh, I can forgive, but I can never forget. <laughs> what is it good? So this kind of thing makes relationships very difficult. <coughs> so devotees have these problems from time to time. Okay, so that's the 11th chapter. Any questions on this? Anybody has any questions on the 11th chapter before we go on? Everybody's okay? Okay, let me open the... Recording in progress. Okay, th those PowerPoints, by the way, they'll be with Annie Ruda. He's planning to come by tomorrow and get them. So you have to get the, the PowerPoints. We'll give you all the PowerPoints for these chapters and you can go through them, you, you get a good overview of each chapter. Might be helpful for your revision. Is everyone able to see the PowerPoint here? Yes, my Okay, good. Mm.
Okay, qualities that endear one to Krishna. This is chapter 12, Bhakti Yoga, devotional set. Review of chapter 11. All right, anybody like to tell me how does the chapter begin? What's the connection with chapter 10? Anybody remember? How did we connect chapter 10 to chapter 11? Maharaj. Yes, Maharaji, go ahead. Uh, uh, Maharaj, uh, Krishna says only through devotional service one can attain me. Otherwise, no one, uh, it is not possible to attain me. So, devotional service is a 12th chapter. So, how to do the devotional service? That Well, well, I'm not on chapter 12. I want to know about chapter 11. How, how does, from 10, did we get to 11? In chapter 10, uh, uh, Krishna describes some of his opulences. So Arjuna sees, can you show them? Can you show them? Okay. Thank you, Maharaji. Yes. At the end of chapter 10, Lord Krishna was describing what need is there for all this detailed knowledge with a single fragment of myself, I pervade and support the entire universe. And then Arjuna, he wants to see how do you pervade and support the entire universe? Because Arjuna can only see Krishna as a chariot driver. So he wants to understand what is this form? In chapter 10, Krishna had been talking about his opulences. Arjuna, now in chapter 11, he wants to see it. He wants to see how Krishna is doing all this. So Arjuna requests Krishna to see this universal form. That's the beginning of the chapter, right? And then after Arjuna's request, then Sanjay and Arjuna, they actually describe this universal form. Sanjay is describing, first of all, what Arjuna is seeing. And then you have Arjuna's questions and Krishna replies. And they, because Arjuna had seen the Kala Rup. So Krishna replied to Arjuna's questions. And then Arjuna offered prayers, describing glories of Krishna and apologizing for being so familiar with Krishna and not giving proper respect to him. And then finally Lord Krishna shows his forearm form and then he comes back to his two-arm form to show Arjuna and all of the devotees, all of us devotees, that, that two-arm form is the original form of the Lord and all the other forms come from that. So that's the eleventh chapter, an overview. Okay, now we're going on. Okay, Maharaji, you want to tell me what's your connection again? Tell me, eleven to twelve. How do we come to pure devotional service? Yes, Maharaji, who was it offering before? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Okay, Prabhu, go ahead. Can I, can I, Maharaj? Yeah, go ahead. Maharaj, uh, in, uh, in the connection between 11 and 12 chapters, Maharaj, uh, after seeing the universal form of Krishna, uh, like, uh, he want, Arjuna wants to clarify that uh, being attached to the personal form of Krishna is superior or universal form is superior. Right. Okay, Arjuna wants to classify what's better. Clarify, like he wants to clarify as a devotee, you know, what is the position of a devotee, like who is working for Krishna. Uh -huh. Okay, can you, confirm. Read, you, want would, to you confirm? Like, would you like to read this for us, please? Yes, the Bhagavad Gita, middle set of six chapters begin with Krishna discussing bhakti and Arjuna wants it to end in the same way. After witnessing Krishna's awesome universal form, Arjuna wishes to confirm his own position as a devotee who works for Krishna as opposed to the jnani, uh, opposed to a jnani who renounces work. All right, so as you were saying like that, Arjuna wants to confirm devotee 
or the jnani who renounces work. Devotee works for Krishna as opposed to a jnani who renounces work. So Arjuna wants to confirm. He's witnessed Krishna's universal form, so now Arjuna wants to know what's better. Should it be a devotee in work or should it be a jnani and renounce work? Again, that question is always coming up. Renounce work, work or not work? Okay, some of our objectives for this 12th chapter. We want to summarize the progression from Varnashram Dharma to perfect Krishna Consciousness as described in the Bhagavad Gita from verses 8 to verses 12. We'll, we'll look at that, the progression. Then we want to cite some examples from Shastra of devotees possessing the qualities which endear one to Krishna described in the Bhagavad Gita verses 13 to 19. Different qualities, so many wonderful qualities are mentioned. So we want to look at these qualities, we should know some of these qualities, we may be asked that kind of thing want to know some qualities mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita, endearing one to Krishna. And then finally we'll have an overview of chapters 7 to 12 and look at the connections between the different chapters and any significant sections in these chapters. So we'll see how it goes. So the chapter 12, not a big chapter, short chapter, but very important, right, based on devotional service. And you can see three sections are mentioned. First of all, discussion is bhakti superior to impersonalism. And then 8 to 12, describing the different stages of devotion. And finally, the qualities that endear one to Krishna. So really a short chapter, just 20 verses, but very important. So let's see how it goes. Here's the first section, Bhakti, superior to impersonalism. Bhakti, the devotee works. Arjuna says, working as a devotee or be a jnani and not work. Oh, let be a jnani, why should you work? <laughs> Sit down, do nothing. It's not the way. Okay, so here's the first verse. Someone like to read? Sanskrit and English? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yeah. Okay, Arun Maharaj. Yes. Bhagavad Gita 12.1. Arjuna Vacha Evam Satata Yukta E Bhattas Tvam Paryu Basate E Chapi Aksharam Avyaktam Tesham Ke Yoga Vittama Arjuna inquired which are considered to be more perfect those who are always properly engaged in your devotional service or those who worship the impersonal Brahman, the unmanifested. Who are those people who worship the impersonal Brahman, the unmanifested? Who does that? Well, how do you call them? Brahmavadis. Brahmavadis. Brahmavadis, yes. Okay. So they worship the unmanifested, the avyakta. Srila Prabhupada explains. Someone read? So factually, there are two types two classes of transcendentalists. Now Arjuna is trying to settle the question of which process is easier and which of the class is most perfect. In other words, he is clarifying his own position because he is attached to the personal form of Krishna. He is not attached to the impersonal Brahman. He wants to know whether his position is... Yeah, he wants to know whether his secure. position is, is secure. secure. So, for his own benefit, Arjuna is asking this question. Text 2, please read someone. Shri Bhagavan Vacha Maya Vesha Manu Yema 
नित्ययुक्त उपासते श्रद्धया परयोपेत तेमे युक्त तम मत The supreme personality of Godhead said, "Those who fix their minds on my personal form and are always engaged in worshiping me with great and transcendental faith are considered by me to be most perfect." So, so what's Krishna's answer to Arjuna's question? Devotees are superior to Brahmavadis. Yes, devotees are superior, right? But who is devotee? How is he described? Those who fix their minds on my personal form, who are always engaged in worshiping me with great and transcendental faith. Okay, so high qualifications, great and transcendental faith. You know, our faith. We have some faith. Do we have great and transcendental faith? And are we always engaged in worshiping Krishna? Well, sometimes we worship Krishna. And can we say always engaged in worshiping Krishna, with great and transcendental faith? Do we never have? Do we have doubts sometimes? Is our minds fixed on the personal form of Krishna? Where is our mind fixed? So where is our mind? Our mind is so many places, everywhere. Right? The restless mind, the turbulent mind, all over the place. But the, this person is described here, their mind is fixed on the personal form of Krishna. So that's a difficult thing actually, you can see, to fix a mind on nitya yukta opasate, like that. So high qualification. Someone read? In answer to Arjuna's question, Krishna clearly says that he who concentrates upon his personal form and who worships him with faith and devotion is to be considered most perfect in yoga. For one in such Krishna consciousness, there are no material activities because everything is done for Krishna. A pure devotee is constantly engaged. Sometimes he chants, sometimes he hears or reads books about Krishna, or sometimes he cooks prasadam or goes to the marketplace to purchase something for Krishna. Or sometimes he was at the temple or the disage. Whatever he does, he does not let a single moment pass without devoting his activities to Krishna. Such action is in full samadhi. Mm -hmm. Jai. So, Prabhupada is describing about this fixing the mind on the personal form. Worshipping with faith and devotion. So is it no material activities? Everything done for Krishna. It appears to be material. The activities The activities appear to be material, but it's all done for Krishna. Pure devotee, always engaged. That's the idea, right? constant engagement. So like, and then so many things to do for Krishna. And the Krishna conscious lifestyle is like that. Very busy. We have many things to do. We can never say have nothing to do. So many books to read, so many rounds to chant, so many slokas to learn, and so much service to do. Cleaning and cooking and, oh, never ends. All right, going ahead. What this text number five? Please read. Krishna Dhikata Rastesham Abhyakta Shakchetasam Abhyakta Hegati Dukham Dehavadvi Avapyate. For those whose minds are attached to the unmanifested impersonal feature of the Supreme, advancement is very troublesome. To make progress in that discipline is always difficult for those who are involved. Yes. So, why is it so difficult for them to make advancement? What is the problem? 
because we are embodied we cannot relate to something that is unmanifested and impersonal you're you're embodied because you have a body so you can't relate to something which is not which doesn't have a body eh? uh, yes Maharaj. okay anybody else Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Can I read Maharaj? Yes. Kesho Dikta Raste Sam Avyakta Shakta Cheta Sam Avyakta Hibati Dukham Deha Vadibir Avapati. For those whose minds are attached to the unmanifested impersonal feature of the supreme advancement it is very troublesome to make progress in that discipline is always difficult for those who are embodied so why is it so difficult for them to make progress Hare krishna maharaj yes prabhu uh, that impersonal form it is very difficult because one has to focus his mind and uh, uh, concentrate on uh, this uh, unmanifested form which is very difficult in, in uh, people of this calula because our minds are quite uh, disturbed and bewildered so uh, so that's probably the reason it is difficult while uh, focusing on uh, the personal features because we live in a material world where everything we see in a physical form so uh, understanding and uh, conceptualizing the phys physical form is, is uh, relatively easier yes right Maharaj, can I try? yes please manage yeah uh, Maharaj, when we have a personal form, we can engage all our senses in serving, like the eye can see the Lord, the nose can smell. But when we focus on the non-manifest form, there is no service mode, there is no, and the senses cannot be engaged. But when we are approaching the Lord with uh, a form, all the senses can be engaged. So in that way, there is uh, no difficulty for a devotee, and he can easily progress, and there are less chances of falling down. Oh, yes. So in that sense, uh, this is more easier and better. Yes, the importance of service, being engaged, yes. Just reading from Prabhupada's purport here in text number 5, Prabhupada explains, he says, Now, here the difference between Jnana Yoga and Bhakti Yoga is definitely expressed. The process of Jnana Yoga, although ultimately bringing one to the same goal, is very troublesome whereas the path of bhakti yoga, the process of being in direct service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, is easier and is natural for the embodied soul. The individual soul is embodied since time immemorial. It's very difficult for him to simply theoretically understand that he is not the body. Therefore, the bhakti yogi accepts the deity of Krishna as worshipable because there is some bodily conception fixed in the mind which can thus be applied. Of course, worship of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in his form in the temple is not idol worship. There is evidence in the Vedic literature that that worship may be saguna or nirguna of the supreme possessing or not possessing attributes. Worship of the deity in the temple is saguna worship, for the Lord is represented by material qualities, but the form of the Lord, though represented by material qualities such as stone, wood or oil paint, is not actually material. That is the absolute nature of the Supreme Lord. And then that famous example is given by Prabhupada 
about the mailboxes. Of course, we don't see so many mailboxes today because it's all emails and stuff, but still, the example is very appropriate that the mailbox is there. So if you make, if you make your own mailbox, the mail's not going to go anywhere. But if you have a, the authorized mailbox, your mail will be delivered. So the same way the deity, the worship of the deity is very important. The deity has to be authorized, has to be properly installed and authorized, it should be uh, according to the scriptures. And then the deity can accept. So this point about deity worship, very important for us. So Prabhupada says, for a devotee, there's no difficulty in approaching the Supreme immediately and directly. But for those who are following the impersonal way to spiritual realization, the path is very difficult. Why? Because they have to understand the unmanifested representation of the Supreme. And they have to do it through Vedic literature, such as the Upanishads. So they have to learn the language and understand the non-perceptual feelings and realize all these processes. Not easy, not easy for a common man. A person in Krishna consciousness engaged in devotional service simply by the guidance of his guru, simply by offering obeisances to the deity, simply by hearing about Krishna or by eating prasadam, it very easily realizes the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So there's no doubt that the impersonalists are unnecessarily taking a troublesome path with the risk of not realizing the absolute truth at the ultimate end. But the personalist, without any risk, approaches the personality of Godhead directly. So Prabhupada's purport is very beautiful and very clear and direct, pointing out the, the shortcomings in the in the path worshipping the impersonal Brahman compared to the direct process of Bhakti Yoga. Prabhupada continues just to read a little more from the, this powerful purport. It is stated there that if one ultimately has to surrender unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but instead takes the trouble to understand what is Brahman, and what is not Brahman, and spends his whole life in that way, the result is simply troublesome. So it's advised here, one should not take up this troublesome path, because there is uncertainty in the ultimate result. A living entity is eternally a soul, and if he wants to merge into the spiritual whole, he may accomplish the realization of the eternal and knowledgeable aspects of his original nature. By the grace of some devotee, such a transcendentalist, highly learned in the process of jnana yoga, may come to the point of bhakti yoga, or devotional service. Right? What is that verse? Jnana yogi comes to the point of bhakti yoga? Anybody? You know this verse? A jnani yogi may come to the point of bhakti yoga. Yes, thank you, Mataji. Very good. So at that time, long practice in impersonalism also becomes a source of trouble because he cannot give up the idea. Therefore, an embodied soul is always in difficulty with the unmanifest, 
both at the time of practice and at the time of realization. <laughs> you can see it doesn't do you any good. You take to the wrong process and you can come to the goal of devotion, you can come to bhakti, but it's difficult to give up all the contamination you've had from it. Okay, so this is a very important verse, which we will often use, of course, in preaching, presenting the personal philosophy against the impersonal philosophy. Mm -hmm. Everyone's okay with that? We'll go ahead. Okay, we read that. Oh no, we didn't read this particular part. Someone like to read? The group of transcendentalists who follow the path of the inconceivable, unmanifested, impersonal feature of the Supreme Lord are called Jnana Yogis. And persons who are in full Krishna consciousness, engaged in devotional service to the Lord, are called Bhakti Yogis. Now, here the difference between Jnana Yoga and Bhakti Yoga is definitely expressed. The process of Jnana Yoga, although ultimately bringing one to the same goal, is very troublesome. Whereas the path of Bhakti Yoga, the process of being in direct service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, is easier and is natural for the embodied soul. Alright. Thank you. So we can read in detail from that purport. Fifth verse. Very important. Here's some of the main points, chart there, comparison between the impersonalism and the personal realizations. Okay. First of all, you can see Brahman realization and Bhagavan realization. So Brahman realization you're focused on the nirguna, no qualities, where we worship the Lord with qualities, saguna. They're concerned with what is inconceivable. It's all inconceivable to them. Brahman is inconceivable. And we say the Lord possesses inconceivable potencies, achincha shakti. They're just saying Brahman is inconceivable, it's beyond the power of the mind to understand. We say the Lord has inconceivable powers and that way is inconceivable. And then the Brahman is all-pervading. Yeah, all-pervading, the Lord is all-pervading through his energies and as super-soul. So our philosophy is personalist right through. Their philosophy is always impersonal, nothing, all-pervading. What is all-pervading? What is inconceivable? Simply this Brahman. What is it? It's inconceivable. It's everywhere, inconceivable, unchanging, fixed and immovable. Unchanging, fixed and immovable. We say the same. Cannot perceive any opulence because of lack of activity. No activity in the Brahman. You go to the Brahman, there's nothing, there's no activity, no variety, no activity, nothing. You're going to get very bored. How long you can stay there? But Lord Krishna, as Bhagavan, is full of six opulences and full of wonderful pastimes, wonderful qualities, so many activities. With taking the path to the Brahman, there's always the risk of not realizing the ultimate truth. You may never reach there. It's not easy. We heard clay show to Kataras. It's very difficult, troublesome. And uh, there's also that verse, Arora Krishrena Param Patam Tata Patanti Addo Nedreta Yasmad Angraya. That they fall back down into the material world. You get to the Brahman, 
You can't stay there. You fall back, come back to the material world because there's no activity, there's no variety, there's no relationships, there's just the oneness. So very dry, very boring. But if you take the path to the Brahman, the path of bhakti, success is guaranteed. Nothing is lost. Whatever advancement you make saves you from the greatest danger. And then finally, we may realize the eternal and knowledgeable aspects of his original nature. So that's partial realization. The eternal, the sat and the chit, sat and chit, but there's no Brahman, there's no ananda, there's no bliss. By the, if you contemplate the Brahman, you, we can only realize those two aspects, the sat and chit. You don't get the bliss. There, there is some tiny drop of happiness in the impersonal Brahman, but it's nothing compared to the ocean of happiness in realizing Bhagavan. So like that, this is a comparison between the two paths. Hare Krishna Maharaj, yes. uh, may I ask a question? Okay. So Maharaj, for, for Bhakti Yogi under Bhagavan realization, the point six, it says success is guaranteed as nothing is lost. So even for Jnana Yogis, if they do not complete their process in this lifetime, wouldn't they continue from where they left in the next life? Or is it completely lost for them? They have to start from the scratch again. Well, certainly they're, they're going to get somewhere, uh, something. I don't know that they're going to lose everything, certainly. But the, the, the problem is that they come back to the material world, right? I quoted that back verse about the, how they fall down, they come back to the material world because there's no proper engagement for them. There's no activity, there's no actual opportunity for them to engage their, themselves. And so they come back to the material world and they often take up welfare activities rather than fully engaging themselves in transcendental activities. Because theirs is the process of negation. They want to stop all activity. You know, see nothing, hear nothing, do nothing. Everything is negation. Not this, and not this, and not this. And so all this nitty-nitty brings them back into the material world. And that's, that's a problem. It, they often drift off into you know, welfare activities, they want to do something. They don't know how to properly engage themselves in transcendental activities. But with Bhakti Yoga, we have, you know, constant activity in hearing and chanting, the glorify, worshipping the deities. It's all, this is all eternal. This is constant engagement in the service of Krishna. Their process is to give up everything, to stop everything. So that's their that's the risk which they they face, because they're they're thinking they they're trying to get away from everything, to give up everything. They try to go away from the world. We want to use everything to engage everything in the world in the service of Krishna. So their path is very difficult. Even, you know, they take with them what they have. What, what, what have they achieved? How far have they got? You know, they've, they've simply realized they're not the body. That's as far as their realization goes. Aham Brahmasmi. Aham Brahmasmi. I am Brahman. Do they know anything else? Do they understand what, is, what does it mean to be Brahman? They don't. They don't understand the function of Brahman. They don't understand that there's a para-Brahman. So this is a problem. 
that they haven't made much advancement. They don't make a lot of advancement. They get, they make, they're detached, maybe detached from the material world. They've given up sense gratification, they've renounced it, but they're not properly situated on the transcendental platform. So it's very difficult for them to maintain because there's no activity. So Maharaj, in this, in this context, four Kumaras were impersonalists. When they, when they first came out of Brahma, when they, when they were born out of Brahma, they were impersonalists. Then when they took darshan of Vishnu in Vaikuntha, by the fragrance coming out of his lotus feet, they became personalist devotees later on. So that's why there is a Sampradaya, poor Kumaras, there is a Sampradaya also, Vaishnava Sampradaya. But uh, the question is, so the impersonalist, even though they are impersonalist, they have access to all the Vaikuntha planets. Right? They could they could go and visit the Vaikuntha planets, they can take darshan of Vishnu. So how do we understand that, uh, Maharaj? Well, for Kumaras, of course, very special, very elevated souls, you see because they have no material desires. Just like Dervasa Muni, he could also go. He could go to Vaikuntha, he could meet Lord Narayan. Right? But he, had, he couldn't stay there. So it's like that. Until you're actually fixed in devotional service. These great souls like Durvasa and the four Kumara, they can go there, but they can't stay there until they're properly situated in devotional service. The four Kumaras generally they're in Tapaloka, up in the higher planets within the universe. They don't stay in the spiritual world because they're not actively engaged in the service of the Lord. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. Okay, we'll go ahead. We have another chart here. Again, personalism and impersonalism. Just to make it very clear. The impersonalists meditate on the formless. Very difficult. A devotee meditates on the deities. Very easy, very pleasurable, very enjoyable to see the deities. We love to go and see the deities. People come so, so eager to see the deities. For the impersonalist path, the process is beyond the senses, restricts the senses, right? They want to stop the senses. But in devotional service, we use the senses. And it, by the senses, we can perceive the deity and the sound of the mantra, and we can use our senses in the service of Krishna. Rishi Kesha Rishi Sikena Sevanam Bhakti Ruchate. What's this devotional service? Number three, we must understand Brahman through the Upanishads, etc. So we have to know the language, Sanskrit. You have to know it. You have to understand it, the meaning. That's very difficult. Even you may be a Sanskrit scholar. It's difficult to understand what is the actual meaning. Not just understand, but actually realize what is being said in the text. But for the devotee, we simply want to understand Krishna through devotional service. And we can do that by chanting His holy name. Then, number four, long practice makes it difficult to take up bhakti. Because we're so attached to that impersonal path. Very difficult. We try to teach people to chant. Difficult to get them to join in the kirtan. Get them to hear the path to hear the, 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 the teachings of the Acharyas because they're so polluted with all the Mayavadi speculation, all the impersonal philosophy. Very difficult. But for a devotee, very natural. Number five, troublesome. 
no relationship with Krishna, a lot of troubles. But devotees, devotional path, miseries mitigated by the relationship with Krishna. They have no relationship, the impersonalists have no relationship with Krishna. But because we are connected to Krishna, all the troubles, devotee doesn't mind trouble in devotional service. A devotee takes pleasure in the difficulties. It makes it more pleasurable for him. And number six, depends on own endeavour. But Krishna delivers a devotee from Maya. Why? Because devotees surrender to Krishna. And Krishna wants to, Krishna wants to serve the devotees. Just as the devotees want to serve Krishna, Krishna wants to serve the devotees. So Krishna delivers the devotees. Said in 12th chapter, we will see how Krishna delivers the devotees. Okay. Going ahead. Oh, here's the verse actually. Krishna delivering the devotee. Tesha maham samudarta mrityu samsara sagarat. Right? Krishna said, I deliver him from the ocean of birth and death. Someone like to read this verse? Maharaj 16.7? Yes, please. But those who worship me, giving up all their activities unto me, being devoted to me without deviation, engaged in devotional service, and always meditating upon me, having fixed their minds upon me, O son of Pritha, for them I am the swift deliverer from the ocean of birth and death. Wow, you're very fluent in reading that Bhagavad Gita. I think you must read it every day. Thank you, Maharaj. Need your blessing. Yes, you're blessed. Keep the Bhagavad Gita on your tongue. Very nice. Okay. Someone read the from the purport. Similarly, a devotee does not need to endeavor to transfer himself by yoga practice to other planets. Rather, the Supreme Lord, by his great mercy, comes at once, riding on his bird carrier Garuda, and at once delivers the devotee from material existence. Although man who has fallen in the ocean of a struggle very hard and may be very expert in swimming, he cannot save himself. But if someone comes and picks him up from the water, then he is easily rescued. Similarly, the Lord picks up the devotee from this material existence. One simply has to practice the easy process of Krishna consciousness and fully engage himself in devotional service. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes, this is the mercy of Lord Krishna, you see. The impersonalist, he is, he's in the ocean, he has to swim himself. <laughs> but the devotee is so fortunate. Krishna comes on the back of Garuda and he will pick, up, pick, us, pick the devotee up from the ocean of birth and death. So it's not that we can deliver ourselves, but Krishna delivers the devotee. The Lord picks up the devotee. We simply have to practice Krishna consciousness and keep ourselves in Krishna's service. And you know, we, can't deliver, we cannot just by our own efforts, it's not just by our own sadhana or anything, but we're dependent on Krishna, that Krishna will come and deliver us. Of course, we don't like to take service from Krishna, we want to give service. And if we, can, if we have that mode of giving service to Krishna, then Krishna will repay that mode at the end of life, Krishna will come and take the devotee back to Godhead. And you can see, so nicely shown in the illustration, right? The devotee is in the ocean 
And there's Lord Krishna coming on the back of Garuda to pick us up out of the ocean. <laughs> we often used to joke that the Sika, the Sika is to pick us up. That Krishna will pick us up by the Sika and take us back to Godhead. I, I don't hear that so much these days, but uh, I know in my early days as a devotee, uh, we all, you know, all the devotees were very young and we all had big sikas. So we, people used to ask us why we had this big sika at the back. And we'd say, Krishna picks us up, takes us back to Godhead, picks us up by the sika. Okay, here's a little exercise you might like to try. Consider Srila Prabhupada's example of dependency on Krishna. How did he exemplify this? Right? Ask students to identify concrete examples. Prabhupada's dependency on Krishna. Would someone like to offer? Some suggestion, examples of Prabhupada's Maharaj. Yes. Can we speak, Maharaj? Yes, okay. Yes, Maharaj. So, uh, uh, as we see that uh, Srila Prabhupada, uh, uh, with almost no money, no resources, went to the uh, uh, United States of America to uh, fulfill the uh, directives of his Guru Maharaj and uh, it, that, that was uh, with, with no connections was hardly knowing anybody uh, but on it uh, he, 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 he was confident that because he is going to spread the name of Krishna, Krishna will always help him and that is how it all happened that as he, he moved ahead with uh, proper convictions and uh, 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 everything got uh, facilitated and in mere 10 years he could able to establish 100 uh, uh, temples all over the world and here one thing we find that he never uh, diluted with his convictions he always stayed firm with his conviction which was very difficult for people from the western world to accept uh, his, his his view but still he remained f uh, firm and uh, uh, people uh, came and became his disciple and taken all the responsibility and uh, under Srila uh, Prabhu the, uh, the guidance uh, the whole uh, ISKCON has been established, uh, established and spread all over the world. So all these things which Prabhupada always says that it, was, it wouldn't have been possible until unless the Krishna was basically facilitating uh, everything. Okay. Yes, right. Prabhupada went to the West and Krishna, he didn't take much with him, right? What did he take with him? And that too, he, he went to the taxi wall when he returned after uh, when he had the second heart attack and when he came back to India with some of his disciples from Delhi airport to going to uh, this old temple's uh, taxi wall, he has taken away all the money. So, uh, so the money, 40 rupees, which with he went to United States when he returned back first time after going to US to India. Uh, in, in from from the airport to the uh, old temple in uh, old Delhi, in that process itself, all the forty rupees is gone. So he, he returned back with the entire money what he has uh, taken along with him uh, when he was going first to uh, United States. Yeah, he, he took with him uh, Mrs. Agarwal, the family who accommodated Prabhupada when he first got to America, in Butler, Pennsylvania. She describes that he came there with a bag of cereal. He had a bag of cereal he brought with him from India. So, so, she, so she thought that was interesting. Hmm. Yes? And Prabhupada also brought with him, when he went to America, he brought with him cases of what? Um, Shreeman Bhagavatam. Yeah. Right. 
How much had he printed at that time? How much? How much was printed? It was the Huh? How much was printed? It was around uh, 250, 300. First canto was itself in three volumes. So he printed only first and second canto. Not second canto, only first canto. In three volumes. Yeah, only the first canto was printed. In three volumes, yes. Second canto, that was printed. First of all, he was printing chapter by chapter. But they didn't work out, so then they printed it together. Okay, so, so uh, I, I, one other, I was thinking a nice example of Prabhupada's dependency on Krishna was when he would ask his disciples to do things. Like uh, it was described by one, of, one scholarly professor who was interviewed about Prabhupada, he'd met Prabhupada, you know, some American professor from a university, somehow he'd met Prabhupada, and he was describing, he said how Prabhupada empowered his disciples. Uh, and he gave the example that he told one of his disciples he wanted him to take over the printing of the Bank to Godhead magazine. And, and uh, the disciple said, but he said, Prabhupada, I don't know anything about it. I've never, I've never done any printing. I never had anything to do with printing or anything. Prabhupada said, that's okay. Krishna will help you. So he always had, had that mood, you know, that Krishna will help you. You know, in, in sending people to the other countries, in sending people to other places, he was totally dependent on Krishna sending a devot devotees to Australia and to South Africa and to Russia and to China and everything, Krishna will help you. That, that, was, a, that was his faith, his complete faith, you know, that depend on Krishna. You don't have to worry, just depend on Krishna. Krishna will help you. Okay. So Prabhupada, not only did he depend on Krishna himself, but he taught, and, and of course we, we learn this also from his own Guru Maharaj, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati. Prabhupada would quote about Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati. The, the, if somebody would ask, uh, will Guru Maharaj, are you going to come to our program? And he said, yes, if Krishna allows. He said, Krishna willing, I will come there. So he would always, like that, come totally dependent on Krishna. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to come, I'm going to take part, if Krishna allows. So by the will of Krishna, not that we're independent. Yeah, okay, I'm coming, yeah, I'm going. No, we're, up, we're totally dependent on Krishna. If Krishna allows me, I'll come. If Krishna wants me to do it, I'll do it. So this is, that's the, the mood which uh, Srila Prabhupada displayed, and they are great acharyas in the line, they have that mood. They're totally dependent on Krishna. And Prabhupada trained us also like that, depend on Krishna. So the second part of the exercise, Srila Prabhupada's emphasis was on surrender to the instructions of the parampara and on confidence in Krishna, looking after our welfare. Identify examples of how we may sometimes fail to follow this. Right? We fail to follow the instructions of the parampara and we lack confidence in Krishna looking after our welfare. Can you think of some examples, maybe individually, or maybe with, in relation to our movement, or other people, people you know, like that? How they're, they're, they're not so surrendered to the parampara, they don't have so much confidence in Krishna, that Krishna will look after us. Must be many examples of that. Uh, 
Yes, please, Sri Devi. Yes. There was, there was one family. It's a very nice devotee, a very nice devotee, and he and his wife. Wife is from India, and then somehow or other they managed to find his clan. They were looking for his and managed to find his clan because they are from clan. So they came, and then uh, they used to come regularly. This happened about seven years ago. They used to come regularly. Then he introduced Krishna consciousness to his neighbor and to his brother. So the brother's family uh, consists of the brother, his his wife, and three children. They were coming nicely, but not as serious as uh, the, the 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 Prabhu, who, who who I was saying who come. Let's just call it Prabhu K. Prabhu K was coming to our temple. Uh, and then his brother, uh, uh, Prabhu R, let's say Prabhu R. So Prabhu R was coming with his wife and three children. Then after that one day, um, there was some kind of a misunderstanding about a name card because uh, Prabhu R uh, gave a name card to one devotee. So somebody from the from uh, our temple misunderstood and thought that uh, Prabhu R was trying to advertise his business in the temple and uh, chastised him. So Prabhu K comes to know about it and one or two other male devotees come to know about it. So there is a kind of a misunderstanding. But since that misunderstanding, which actually could be solved quite easily, that Prabhu doesn't, with the, with the, the Prabhu who is the brother of the other Prabhu stopped coming to the temple. Sometimes they come for festivals, like big festivals like Radha Yatra. And the other day when I asked Prabhu K, how's Prabhu R and his family? Uh, are they taking up Krishna consciousness still? He said, oh no, they have uh, lost interest and uh, not really practicing now. So it was so sad because a whole group had come, you know, father, mother, three children. I was so happy to see an entire family because I don't have that in my life. So when I see families like that, I get very excited to see a father, a mother and three children coming to the temple. And I was thinking, you know, so wonderful. But because of that small misunderstanding, and then I don't know, and then they stop coming. They don't want to come to Krishna consciousness. So it's very sad. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very sad. So, as Prabhupada would say, we shed gallons of blood to bring a person to Krishna consciousness. You have to shed gallons of blood to get one soul to come to Krishna consciousness. And sometimes, you know, we work so hard to train them and bring them up in Krishna consciousness, but some, somehow still they go away, they give up. It's so sad, such a, a disappointment. So, these problems are there. We may, may fail to follow. We lack confidence that Krishna is going to look after our welfare. Just like when we have devotees in the temple, sometimes the devotees are anxious for their own welfare. It's difficult for them. You know, in the, early, in the beginning of our Krishna consciousness movement, particularly uh, our movement, our temple, for example, in the UK, in London, was uh, very basic and frugal. And we lived a very simple life and we shared everything, even the clothes we had. We would all just share the clothes between us, you know. Whoever happened to be there, when the clothes came back from the laundry, then you tried to pick out which one you wanted. <laughs> Nobody really had their own things. Everything was, sh was shared. But still, not everybody can live like that. Not everybody's so happy to live in that uh, kind of ashram atmosphere. But that was the mood in the beginning of the movement. And people would come and people would go. And then the instructions of the parampara. We'd always get people come, they would think they know better. No, oh, no, this is not right. No, you shouldn't do this, you should do it like that. <laughs> 
and especially in relation to deity worship, you know, there will always be different ways in which people do things, and who can do things, and so many issues. So we try to stick to the parampara, surrender to the parampara. Of course, even in the parampara there can be flexible fle uh, flexibility, not everything is so rigid. The confidence in Krishna looking after us, not only economically, but you know, uh, physically, is he going to look after my health? Well, how long, how long will we live? How long do we expect to live? You know, we're all, we all have the material body. We have to know that disease is inevitable for everyone. You cannot avoid it. Everyone gets disease. And that was the impetus behind Lord Buddha in the beginning, right? He, he'd never seen a sick person before. And he saw a sick person, he saw an old person, and he saw a dead person. And then he went for samadhi. He thought, that's it, I don't want to be in this world. I want to get out of this world. So, we should understand that Krishna is there, and he's certainly looking after our welfare. But we have to understand it in the spiritual sense, not just simply in terms of material facilities, but in the spiritual sense. He's taking care of us and he's helping us so that we can be fixed on that path back home, back to Godhead. It may take us some time, but we, we know Krishna is there with us. And Prabhupada certainly taught us like that. Prabhupada said we, his Guru Maharaj was always by his side, leading him. So he had that, that faith in the parampara. Rupa Goswami also had appeared to Prabhupada and told him, you just go to America and write these books. And he said, I will take care of everything. And so Prabhupada had the instruction of the parampara from Rupa Goswami. What more could you want? He went off to America and he wrote the books, he did it. And he had total confidence that Krishna is looking after the, our movement. Krishna is taking care. Just, they opened the temple in London and they wanted deities. They had no deities in London. They wanted to have a deity. They didn't know what to put on the altar. And Krishna arranged. They got these beautiful marble Radhakrishna deities and they could put them on the altar and worship them. They're still worshipped there today. Krishna arranges. Krishna takes care. We saw also Gorgavinda Maharaj went to Bhubaneswar. Bhubaneswar, the, the land had been given to Gorgavinda. It was a remote land. There was nothing. It was jungle. But years later, you go back and it's surrounded with so much houses, so much activity. The highway also moved closer. Oh my goodness, you know, more, they became more <laughs> crowded and congested than we ever wanted. And a big temple came up also and many devotees also came. So Krishna arranged, Krishna takes care of everything. If we just surrender to Krishna, then Krishna can provide. People, we see all the devotees who came from Russia, how much, how much they suffered, the difficulties they went through. But they came. And now, so many centers there, so many devotees in Russia. So, Lord Chaitanya taught us. The holy name will be spread all over the world, every town and village. A lot of people doubted it. They thought, oh, it's just a nice saying, it won't really happen. But it actually came true. If you have the faith, you have the conviction, it will happen. Okay, we'll go on to this next section here in the 12th chapter.
8 to 12, progressive stages of devotion. Make a diagram showing the various stages as they are described in chapter 12, verses 8 to 12. It's a bit difficult for us to do that online. Anyway, let's see what we've got here. Okay, <laughs> here's our diagram. Let's look at it. Uh, verses 8 to 12. I hope you've got a Bhagavad Gita beside you. Right? Text number eight. Just fix your mind upon me, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and engage all your intelligence in me. Thus you will live in me always, without a doubt. So, where would you rate that? Is that High level or low level or intermediate? High level. Huh? High level. High level. Yes. Why? Why do you say it's high level? Maradhi. Because we live in a relationship with Krishna. Because of mind. Mind is fixed in Krishna. Mind is fixed, right. Fix your mind on me. Right? What, and then also, intelligence also in me. Engage all your intelligence in me. Live in me always, without a doubt. So th this is very high level devotional service, right? Prabhupada writes in the purport, one who is engaged in Lord Krishna's devotional service lives in a direct relationship with the Lord. So there is no doubt that his position is transcendental from the very beginning. A devotee does not live on the material plane. He lives in Krishna. The holy name of Krishna and the Lord are non-different. So when a devotee chants Hare Krishna, Krishna and his internal potency are dancing on the tongue of the devotee. When he offers Krishna food, Krishna directly accepts eatables. Krishna directly accepts the eatable. The devotee becomes Krishna eyes by eating the remnants. One who does not engage in such service cannot understand how this is so, although there, this is a process recommended in the Bhagavad Gita and in other Vedic literatures, right? So people, they, ordinary people, they don't do devotion, they cannot understand how Krishna is doing these things. But the pure devotees know. Okay, so tap, verse number 8 is right on the top. Pure devotional service, right? So, can you do that? Anybody in the class tonight can do that? Are you on that level? Anybody? Nobody, right? Not very common. It's very high level devotional service. So, we'll go down a stage. Next level. My dear Arjuna, O winner of wealth, if you cannot fix your mind upon me without deviation, where was that? Fix your mind upon me without deviation? That was text number? Eight. Thank you, Mariji. Yes. We're on nine. Previous text was, if you cannot, previous text was describing fix your mind upon me without deviation. We can't do it. So, what can you do? Follow the regulated principles of Bhakti Yoga. In this way, develop a desire to attain me. Who knows, what are the regulated principles of Bhakti Yoga? No meaning. No. Chant the holy names of Krishna, offer Bhogar to Krishna and eat only the remnants of 
ఇటువంటి ప్రసాదం వెడ్డింగ్ ఇయరింగ్ Yeah, you have to understand what is actually the regulative principles of bhakti yoga. Sometimes people think this simply means, oh, no meat, fish and eggs, no intoxication, no gambling, no illicit sex. But it's not quite like that. No, we have to understand what it means. Prabhupada explains in the purport of text number 9, it says uh let me find it rise in the morning yes right to practice to practice the regulative principles of bhakti yoga one should under the guidance of an expert spiritual master follow certain principles one should rise early in the morning take bath enter the temple offer prayers chant hari krishna collect flowers to offer to the deity cook foodstuffs to offer to the deity take prasada and so on there are various rules and regulations which one should follow and one should constantly hear bhagavad gita and shrimad bhagavatam from pure devotees this practice can help anyone rise to the level of love of god and then he is sure of his progress into the spiritual kingdom of god This practice of bhakti yoga under the rules and regulations and with the direction of a spiritual master will surely bring one to the stage of love of God right so this is the one step down from the pure devotional service right first text 8 was describing the topmost level text 9 describing you can't you're not able to fix your mind so what are you going to do going to practice the regulative principles right it was mentioned practice the regulative practice the regulative principles of bhakti yoga and the result of that is develop a desire to attain krishna we have to, we have to understand these statements very important so develop a desire to attain krishna practice the regulative principle rise early in the morning chant hari krishna worship the de the morning program everyone should have their morning program right some people oh, i get up late i only do an evening program not very good you should have the morning program you should have morning sadhana right morning program auspicious time get up in the morning and engage in bhakti yoga do some chanting worship the deity get flowers offer arti these things not a good idea if you leave all your chanting just do your chanting at night it's not very good so prabhupad explains in the purport here to text number 9 he said in this verse two different processes of bhakti yoga are indicated the first applies to one who has actually developed an attachment for krishna the personality of godhead by transcendental love and the other is for one who has not developed an attachment for the supreme person by transcendental love for the second class there are different prescribed rules and regulations one can follow 
to be ultimately elevated to the stage of attachment to Krishna. So attachment, this attachment to Krishna talking about raga bhakti or rati, this attachment to Krishna, right? There's spontaneous uh, sadhana bhakti and there is uh, Vaidhi, there's Vaidhi sadhana bhakti and Raganuga sadhana bhakti. So Vaidhi sadhana bhakti, mean, well first of all, sadhana bhakti means devotional service in practice. There are three levels of bhakti, there's sadhana bhakti, bhava bhakti, prema bhakti. Sadhana bhakti is divided into two. There is Vaidhi sadhana bhakti, meaning according to rules and regulations, and Raganuga sadhana bhakti, where one has spontaneous attachment to the Lord. So different processes of practicing, different levels, to come to that level of spontaneous attachment, one has to have a natural attraction for the service of Krishna. Naturally, the, uh, Prabhupada gives the example is that in the beginning, waking up early in the morning is difficult. But after some time, we wake up naturally. Without the alarm clock, even you wake up. So, Raganuga Satna Bhakti is like that the spontaneous attraction to serve Krishna without thinking about the rules and regulations. Bhakti Yoga is the purification of the senses. At the present moment, the senses are always impure, being engaged in sense gratification. But by the practice of Bhakti Yoga, these senses can become purified. And in the purified state, they come directly in contact with the Supreme Lord. In this material existence, I may be engaged in some service to some master, but I don't really lovingly serve my master. I simply serve to get some money. And the master also is not in love. He takes service from me and pays me. So there's no question of love. But for spiritual life, one must be elevated to the pure stage of love. Stage of love can be achieved by practice of devotional service performed with the present senses. Someone just said to me this afternoon when I was giving another class, someone said that, oh, desire for sense gratification is always there. How can you give it up? You can't stop it. You might as well just serve it. <laughs> so no need to serve Krishna. He said, desire for sense gratification is already there. Just satisfy the senses. <laughs> Rascal. What nonsense. So Prabhupada continues that love of God is in a dormant stage in our heart. It's manifested in different ways, but it's contaminated by material association. Heart has to be purified of the material association. And then Prabhupada then explains how to practice bhakti yoga, taking the guidance of the spiritual master. And this will, this will help us come to the level of love of God. And then enter into the spiritual world. Okay, so that's text number nine. Maybe, maybe this is a good place to stop tonight because we've got enough to do tomorrow, to finish off tomorrow. Uh, I think I'd like to stop here tonight. We'll continue f from this point tomorrow. Yes, Maharaj. Yeah. Okay. Are there any qu any questions before we stop? Anything? Okay. So, 
Thank you very much. I had one question. Yes, Prabhu. Paraji, can all the devotees uh, see Lord Krishna in two-handed form? Well, we heard tonight, it's a qualification. You have to be pure. You want to see Krishna, you have to be pure. Two-handed form. Of course, you can see Krishna in the deity. But Prabhupada then also taught us, he said, that, that, you know, that uh, don't try to see Krishna, but try to act in a way Krishna will come and see you. That's more important. You act in such a way that Krishna will come and see you. One of my god brothers was describing how he, when he first became a devotee, he came to Krishna consciousness because he heard that he could see God, wanted to see God. <laughs> so. He was sitting there the very first evening Prabhupada came in, first, first thing Prabhupada said, <laughs> said, don't try to see God. <laughs> don't try to see God. Act in a way God will come to see you. That's more important. But God is there. Kali Kali Nama Rupe Krishna Avatar. He comes in the Kali Yuga in the form of his holy name. He's there in the deity, and he's there in the Srimad Bhagavatam. After Lord Krishna left the world, the Srimad Bhagavatam is there. And Prabhupada said, if we read the Srimad Bhagavatam, one day you'll actually see Krishna in the pages of Srimad Bhagavatam. You just have to study Srimad Bhagavatam very genuinely and sincerely, and one day you'll see Krishna there in the pages of Bhagavatam. So Prabhupada. Huh? I'm grateful to you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much. Hare Krishna Srila Prabhupada Ki. Hare Krishna.